you know there's always that one topic where people keep asking you to do but you kind of feel reluctant because you know that this is a topic that is very long but anyways if i had a penny for each time someone asked me to do a topic on tb on this channel i would be a millionaire that goes to tell you a lot so i finally decided to put this video together grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at tuberculosis. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. One big challenge about infectious diseases is that they're constantly being reviewed and even newer information is coming out, newer drugs are coming out, newer regimens are coming out, so it's something that you can't constantly just make one video on and then just leave it like that. So they are always being reviewed each and every single year. So I'll try and give you some of the information that is going to be helping you in learning the principles of the topic. And then I will also introduce a little bit about the new aspects that are there or are currently in the world. So remember, TB is a very, very important condition, especially in our setup here. A lot of people, if not over 90% of people, are walking around with some form of TB in their lungs. It may be active TB, it may be latent TB. I'll explain what that means very shortly. So remember that this is going to be a multisystemic infection that is causing a type of chronic necrotizing disease. Remember that the type of necrosis that we often see with TB is a special type of necrosis that is known as caseous necrosis, meaning that it's going to be appearing like cheese. It's going to be caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. There are different species that can cause TB. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the most common. You could also have Mycobacterium bovis. This would be in the background of someone who drinks milk from the source, drinks milk directly from the cow. And they don't pasteurize milk, they don't boil the milk. So with pasteurization of the milk, the evidence, or rather the prevalence of Mycobacterium bovis has decreased. But those that live in the rural setups often get this type of TB. And it affects the GIT commonly. And this should make sense because if you drink the milk, it's going into your GIT. You may also have Mycobacterium africanum, which humans are reservoirs. You also have Mycobacterium microti. So remember that Mycobacterium itself is an encapsulated organism. Very important to remember. It will have this thick cell wall, which has mycolic acid. These two things, the capsule and the mycolic acid, are very important because they're going to be impeding and are going to be preventing the process of phagocytosis, which is cell eating. So the macrophages, the neutrophils that are supposed to phagocytose these organisms are pretty much not effective at doing this because of the mycolic acid, because of the capsule. So this allows TB to actually survive within the macrophages. It allows it to actually start multiplying at some time. If your immune system is not strong enough, for example, in the children or in the elderly or someone who's immunocompromised, then they may actually present with uh, active disease of TB. Remember that the cell wall is quite thick. It has a high uh, component of lipid in it. So this means that it's going to be relatively impermeable. And when you stain it with a, gra with a gram stain, it actually weakly stains with a gram stain. So it's very difficult to classify as whether it's gram negative or gram positive. But we can demonstrate it using a staining technique, which is known as an acid fast staining technique. So here, we're going to get a dye and we're going to combine it with phenol. Then we stain the mycobacterium. Then when we attempt to wash away this with an acid organic solvent, remember that the bacteria is going to resist this decolorization with this acidic solvent. This is why we refer to it as acid fast bacilli or AFB. You'll see AFB a lot in this particular lecture. The mycobacterium is an obligate aerobe. It loves air. So meaning that you're going to find it a lot in the apices of the lungs. You'll see it in the apical regions of the lungs on chest x-ray because that's where you have the highest amount of oxygen tension. It's a facultative intracellular pathogen that is rod shaped, it doesn't form any spores and it grows very slowly. This is very important because when you do a culture in this particular patients, it will take a very long time for you to grow 
it has a generational time of about 12 to 8 hours. Generally, it can be classified anatomically based on whatever it's affecting. 80% and the majority of the cases are going to be affecting the lungs. Remember, I say TB is a multisystemic thing. So if it's affecting the lungs, you refer to this as pulmonary TB. 80% of the cases are going to be this. So it can affect the lung parenchyma. It can affect the tracheobronchial tree. It can also cause miliary TB. These are these millet-like seeds of the lungs. We do classify it as a form of pulmonary TB. 75 to 80 percent of them are going to have smear positive so meaning if you test their sputum you're going to isolate mycobacterium for it 20 to 25 percent of the cases are going to be smear negative so they won't have these mycobacterium that you're able to detect in the sputum and remember that these ones who are smear positive they can transmit the infection because they have the bacteria in the sputum remember that the transmission is through respiratory droplets these that have a smear negative result they generally do not transmit the infection then extra pulmonary TB accounts for 20% of the cases. This is much more common in the immunocompromised. So remember that a patient, if a patient is presenting with both pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB, we classify it as a case of pulmonary TB. So it could affect the lungs, it could affect the pleura, it could affect the lymph nodes, it could affect the ab abdomen, it could affect the genital urinary tract, it can affect the skin, the joints, the bones, the meninges, even the eyes. So TB is a multisystemic thing. So there's just a few definitions I want you to know. So a, a presumptive case is where you have the suspicion. So a patient who presents with these signs and symptoms of TB and they also have the chest x-ray findings that are very suggestive of TB. We call that as a presumptive case of TB. So these patients, we can sometimes start them on treatment. Actually, we do start them on treatment, but you have to order certain tests to confirm the TB. An index case is where the uh, initially an, an identified case of TB in a specific household or other comparable setting in which others have, may have been exposed. So it's like this person that has TB and has potentially spread it to the others. Those are the people that are exposed to the index, we refer to them as a contact. If it's a household contact, it's just simply a person who has shared the same enclosed space with this index case of uh, three months before commencement of the current treatment. Then a close contact, it's someone who is not in the household but has shared an enclosed space, for example, a social gathering, a workplace, a facility for an extended period during the day with the index case three months before commencement of the treatment. And of course, incidental TB case are just simply the sum of the new and the relapse cases of TB in a specific period. I'll explain what relapse is later on in this particular lecture. So TB is generally transmitted through those that are smear positive. Remember, those that have carotary TB, those that have a laryngeal TB, these are sources of infection because they will have this mycobacterium in the sputum. Those with culture negative pulmonary TB and extra pulmonary TB generally are not infectious. And remember, it can be transmitted from one person to another through inhalation of infected droplets, which could be excreted when someone is coughing, when they're sneezing, when they're speaking. And you only need a small amount of bacteria for you to actually develop the disease. So those that are infected could develop active disease. And remember that the how you're going to be developing the disease or why you develop the disease will depend on a certain number of factors. Basically, your host immune. If your immune system is strong and keeps the infection under check, it will go into latency. Waiting for a time later on when your immune system will dip, then it will reactivate and cause you disease. And some patients can actually get it through drinking of non-sterilized infected cow's milk. That's usually with transmission of mycobacterium bovis. So this has decreased because we now educate people to boil the milk and as well as pasteurization of milk that is sold in most of the shops, if not all of them. So the factors that will facilitate transmission, remember anything that will bring you closer to this person that has TB. So presence of a contact, the infectivity of a contact. Remember, those that have a higher bacterial load, greater transmission. The duration of contact, if there's prolonged exposure, if you're living with this person, if you're married to them, you're sharing the same bed. Intimacy, how close the source and the subject are, as well as the environment. It's very common in overcrowded areas, very common in poorly ventilated areas. So it's very common in jails, it's very common in boarding houses, where there's a lot of sharing of individuals in a particular room. Remember that patients who acquire the infection may not develop the disease. Like I told you, if you have a strong immune system, it may keep it under check. You don't develop the disease. But later on, when your immune system falls, you may actually reactivate and you develop the disease. So the rate of clinical disease is actually high during the late adolescent period. 
and the early adulthood period, though we don't know why this is so. The infections are much more common in young women than they are in men. The factors that will increase your risk of developing active TB, think immunosuppression. It could be HIV, where you're co-infected with HIV and TB. I think I did discuss a bit of this on my HIV series. Head over and watch the HIV videos if you haven't already. This is because there's a suppression of the cell-mediated immune system. Then you, mo you may also have um, hematological or even other malignancies like lymphomas, leukemias. You may have chronic renal failure, the diabetes mellitus. You may have immunosuppressive drug use like long-term use of corticosteroids, prednisolone old age, which can cause decreased immunity, malnutrition, which is a very important factor because it will give you some sort of immunosuppression that is very similar to HIV. You also have alcohol intake. Now here I want to explain how the pathophysiology is coming about. So remember that most of the TB is going to be pretty much gotten through the transmission of the respiratory droplets. So you're going to be getting this and it's going to be by passing all your lung defenses. So let's say here, I'll draw an alveoli here. And this person here has been infected with a mycobacterium. So this here that I've drawn is a mycobacterium. So this mycobacterium enters into the alveoli and it's going to cause irritation of these cells. Remember, they are cells that are lining the alveoli. It'll cause irritation of these cells and these cells are then going to produce some cytokines. They're going to produce some interleukins. Initially, you have a macrophage that is getting to this area of inflammation. So this macrophage pretty much will engulf this mycobacterium and then it will also now present this antigen because remember this is an antigen presenting cell. It will present this antigen to of course your antigen presenting cells after it's being phagocytosed. It will present it to your antigen presenting cells which are your lymphocytes your T helper cells. Now, in the process, these macrophages are also going to be producing neutrophilic chemoattractant. So this neutrophilic chemoattractant is also going to be causing neutrophils to um, be coming to the area of inflammation. It will cause the neutrophils to also come to the area of this inflammation. And these neutrophils are also phagocytic cells. So to some extent, they're also going to phagocytose this. Now, remember, as this is happening, the mycobacterium is going to be ineffectively digested because of the mycolic acid that you have inside, because of the thick capsule that you have inside and some capsular antigens that will prevent effective phagocytosis. Because remember, in the process of phagocytosis, you have this uh, organism that is engulfed. You form what is known as a phagosome inside this macrophage, and this phagosome is supposed to fuse with a lysosome to form a phagolysosome. Remember that these lysosomes have these hydrolytic enzymes on their inside that can help in digestion of whatever is present in the phagosome. So this doesn't happen effectively. So in addition to this, what's now happening at cellular level is this. So you're going to have some macrophages, and these macrophages will have some of the mycobacterium on the inside. So you have some macrophages there that may have some of the mycobacterium on the inside. You may also even have some mycobacterium that are actively dividing there. You have some that are dead and you have some that are dying. So now, if this infection is kept under check, it means that you won't have active disease. So if the mycobacterium continues developing and it will continue dividing and replicating, so it may sometimes kill off these macrophages that you have here and then it may cause active disease. Now, if your immune system is strong enough, it may actually ward off this infection and actually contain the infection. So what will happen is that some of the macrophages will begin to change shape. They'll begin to flatten out. So they'll begin to flatten out and surround this focus of infection. So these cells that have flattened out are what we refer to as epithelioid cells. Remember, Anything that ends in OID means like. So epithelioid, I don't know how I've spelled that. Epithelioid cells, it means they look like epithelium. So just pretty much modified types of macrophages. So you form these epithelioid cells, which are going to be surrounding this focus. Some of these macrophages will fuse with each other and form these huge cells. What's characteristic about these huge cells is that they're multinucleated number one, and their nuclei are actually arranged in sort of like a horseshoe pattern. So you're going to be forming what is known as multinucleated Langerhans giant cells. So you have these 
uh, giant cells that are forming as well. These giant cells are pretty brutal. So they can pretty much release all their hydrolytic enzymes on the outside of the on the outside of the uh, cytoplasm and spill their hydrolytic enzyme and cause a lot of damage. So you find out that at the center here you have a lot of necrosis that is happening here. And remember that the special type of necrosis we refer to that as caseous necrosis it appears like cheese. You may also have some lymphocytes in the periphery. You have some lymphocytes in the periphery over there. So you have your lymphocytes. So this is maybe a lymphocyte you're going to be having your giant cells. This is going to be your giant cells. In the area, you have an area of necrosis that is happening there. You have, of course, your dying uh, alive bacterium. You have your dying or, or alive macrophages and neutrophils on the center. And, of course, your epithelioid cells. This, what I've described here, is what we refer to as a TB granuloma. So you're going to be having this TB granuloma forming within the lungs. So sometimes this TB granuloma could deposit calcium, because remember that calcium tends to accumulate where there's a lot of dead tissue. It's a process that we call dystrophic calcification. So you have a lot of calcium depositing here, and sometimes you may be able to see this on the x-ray as this bright spot on the chest x-ray because you know calcium is a metal it will have a high density it won't allow x-rays to pass through so you'll be able to see it on the x-ray so if this granuloma calcifies we refer to that as a gone focus so a gone focus is pretty much a calcified granuloma so if this calcifies we refer to that as a gone focus sometimes the infection can enter into the lymphatics and also go and cause inflammation of the lymphatics. So if those lymphatics are inflamed, there's this hyla lymphadenopathy. So if you have a gone focus, meaning that you have a calcified granuloma plus hyla lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy, then we are going to be uh, calling this now as what we call a primary complex of Ranke. If it's calcified, we can actually refer to it as a gone complex. Now, if this infection is kept under check, like I told you, the patient will go into latent TB. If the infection is not kept under check, they'll develop active TB. These granulomas could remain dormant for quite some time. And up until your immune system dips, then there's reactivation and the patient develops reactivation TB. Okay, so now let's get back to this. So remember, infection is going to be transmitted through droplet infection. So there's initially recruitment of macrophages and the lymphocytes. Then the activated macrophages will release your neutrophilic chemoattractants, as well as your cytokines to, of course, stimulate the immune system. Remember, this is a cell-mediated immune response. These macrophages are going to be presenting the antigen to the lymphocytes, and then, of course, they are going to undergo changes, and they will form the epithelioid and the Langerhans cells which aggregate and form your classical tubercular, tuberculous granulomas. There may be some caseous necrosis forming in this granulomas. And remember that when you get this caseous necrosis happening at the center with this granuloma, and of course the, with the surrounding areas of fibrosis, the giant cells, you have the epithelial cells, and the lymphocytes, you refer to that as a gone focus. Then if you have this Together with the regional lymphadenopathy, you refer to that as a primary complex of Ranke. If these lymph nodes are calcified, then we refer to that as a gone complex. So, like I said, if this has been encapsulated very well, the bacteria will not spread. So the patient enters a phase which is known as latent TB. So if there's no further complications, you're just going to be seeing this evidence of calcification on the X-ray. Now remember, those patients that are immunosuppressed, those patients with HIV, you only see these granulomas forming and these calcifications forming because the immune system is functional. So it means that someone who's severely immunosuppressed, you may actually get a normal x-ray. So the center is going to be having of living bacteria that may sometimes become dormant, they multiply, they flare up when the immune system drops, then they reactivate and cause reactivation TB. So if the bacteria inside the macrophages rapidly multiply, they may kill off the macrophage, they may sometimes even disseminate. So remember, on initial contact, less than 5% of patients will develop active disease, and the percentage is increased to 10% within the first year of exposure. If it remains dormant, 
it goes into latent TB. It may sometimes reactivate later on in life. So keep in mind, a gone focus, pretty much a calcified granuloma. A gone focus plus hyalur lymphadenopathy, you call that as a gone complex. Then a gone focus plus a calcified ipsilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, we call that as a primary complex of Ranke. I think I may have switched these two terms in the previous explanation, so take notes of that. So here's the difference between latent and active TB. So latent TB, you have the bacilli in the gone focus. Active TB, you have the bacilli in the tissues, you have them in the secretions. Latent TB is smear negative and culture negative, so it's not really infectious. Active TB, the sputum is commonly smear positive, the culture is going to be positive. Mycobacterium tuberculosis could be cultured from the infected tissues. If you do a tuberculin skin test, it will be positive in latent infections, it will be positive in active disease, it may even ulcerate. When you do your chest x-ray, you're going to be seeing this gone focus that can be visible. And then in active disease, you may see consolidations, cal ca cavitations, effusions, and latent TB is often asymptomatic. Over 90% of the population is walking around with latent TB. Active TB will have the constitutional symptoms, the night sweats, the fever, the weight loss, the cough. And remember, in terms of cough, if it's an HIV patient, a cough of any duration suspect TB. Even in normal patients, the cough of any duration suspect TB, but more or less, we usually go for more than two weeks. Then the latent infection, like I said, is not infectious. Active disease is infectious if the bacilli is present in the sputum. So you get this initial infection with the bacilli. You get this dendritic cell innate immune response, the T adaptive uh, response, and then this results in the formation of a gone focus or a gone complex, which is a gone focus plus high lymphadenopathy. Then if it calcifies, um, you may call that as a gone complex or a primary complex of Ranke. Then you get this granulomatous infection. So if it's kept in check, then the patient goes into latent TB. Then Sometimes you may have inert immune response that clears out the bacilli before it actually reaches the lymph node, so there'll be no infection, there'll be no memory response. This happens within four to six weeks. If they fail to control the infection, it develops primary active TB, which could be pulmonary in the majority of the cases and extra pulmonary in the minor cases, especially those that are immunosuppressed. Then latent TB later on can reactivate into reactivation TB, 55% of the cases, and 45% in extrapulmonary disease. This takes about months to years. It could affect the lymph nodes, the bones, the brain, miliary TB, gastrointestinal tract TB, genitourinary tract TB, pericardial, the eye, the skin, it can sometimes even be just disseminated. So what are the clinical manifestations of pulmonary TB? So remember that patients will present with this constitutional symptoms. So they'll have this productive cough that may sometimes be blood stained. So they may have some hemoptysis and they'll have the systemic symptoms, things like weight loss, fever, night sweats. The night sweats are very common at the end of the day and they can be found throughout the night and they can actually be quite drenching for the patients. They'll describe it as them being soaked in sweat when they wake up at night. So this TB could be classified as primary pulmonary TB, where someone gets the infection for the first time, then the, it flares up and causes active disease. And then secondary or reactivation TB, is, sometimes it could be a latent infection that reactivates, or sometimes it could get a reinfection with TB. So the extra pulmonary involvement is far less common in primary disease and is much more common in areas where there's high endemicity of TB. So remember, primary pulmonary disease, very common in children. So here it follows after primary infection, so there's no other prior history of them being infected with TB. Common in children below the age of four, and usually presents as an initial infection. It's seen commonly in the middle and the lower zones of the lungs. Majority of the cases, it can heal spontaneously. It will leave behind a healed scar, which is a gone lesion. Sometimes it may be contained by the immune system. It goes into a dormant stage and flares up later on in life when the immune system is reduced. Remember that in children, or immunocompromised individuals, the disease usually spreads rapidly and involves the lungs, the pleura, the mediastinal lymph nodes. It may sometimes disseminate into the bloodstream, and it may also result in miliary TB. They are going to have this two to three week history of fever, night sweats, anorexia, weight loss, and a dry cough. Then in terms of reactivation TB or secondary TB here, they don't have any evidence prior of uh, development of infection when they had the primary infection. Maybe it has been dormant for many years or for some many decades before actually being reactivated. We call this as post-primary TB. We can call this as secondary TB. 
very common in the episodes of the lungs because it's higher oxygen tension. Remember, this is a strict aerobic organism. So here, the disease may extend and cause small infiltrates. Sometimes it may even cause large cavities. I'll show you some x-rays of what it looks like. Early in the disease, you may have this intermittent fever, night sweats, weight loss, anorexia, weakness. And most of these patients later on may, may have a dry cough initially, but later on it will become productive. It may have white, white sputum. Sometimes it may be blood stained. Patients who have this exertion of dyspnea, hoarseness of the voice, if there is some involvement of the larynx, the laryngeal involvement. Physical examination, you're going to see this chronically sick patients. They may be pale, they may have finger clubbing, they may have inspiratory crepitations. Remember, in terms of extrapulmonary TB, it accounts for 20% of the cases in those that are HIV negative, but it's much more common in those that are HIV positive. It commonly affects the lymph nodes, the pleura, the meninges, the genital urinary system, the bones, the adrenals, and sometimes even the peritoneum. So beginning with the meninges, so TB meningitis. So here it's common in children, it's common in those that are immunosuppressed and those that are living with HIV. More than half of them will have evidence of some lung disease. And you're going to have features of headache, fever, confusions, behavioral change, vomiting, lethargy, photophobia, neck rigidity that's lasting for about two weeks or more. So it's more or less like a gradual presentation as opposed to bacterial meningitis, which tends to be quite acute. You may have some signs like fever, nuchal rigidity, altered mental state, loss of consciousness, and these patients may have cranial nerve lesions, cranial nerve palsies, seizures. How do we investigate for TB meningitis? We do a lumbar puncture. So we send that CSF for biochemistry, gen expert, and an acid fast bacillus stain. So on your biochemistry, you're going to see a lot of white blood cells inside the CSF. Initially, it may be a lot of polymorph nuclear cells, but later on, you're going to see a lot of lymphocytes and monocytes in your CSF. You're going to have a very high concentration of protein, greater than 2 to 3 grams per liter. You see a low concentration of glucose. Remember, this makes sense. You have glucose in the CSF. If you have a bacteria that is there, it needs glucose to multiply. So it will eat up the glucose in the CSF. And remember that CSF glucose is compared to the blood glucose. So it would be less than half of the blood glucose at the time when you're doing the lumbar puncture. But any of these could be normal in the presence of the disease. So your AFB uh, can be seen in um, sediment CSF in 20% of the cases. And this percentage increases if the examined CSF volume is increased. So the culture may be positive in about 80%, but it takes up to four to six weeks to grow. It grows very slowly. We treat these patients with TB treatment. This should be for 12 months because it's a severe form of TB. And remember, all severe forms of TB, we must add corticosteroids. I'll talk about management of TB very shortly and which drugs we're going to be using. In terms of pericardial TB, which is another form of severe TB, so this one here, is can arise from a ruptured abdominal lymph node or even hematogenous dissemination. So your patients who have this chronic low-grade fever that may be present, especially in the evening, they have associated features of acute pericarditis. So they'll have this retrosternal pain, which is going to be worsened by um, lying flat and made better by leaning forward. They'll have this cough, dyspnea, generalized edema. They may sometimes even have a pericardial effusion. Cardiac tamponade may sometimes be present. It may develop a, a complication that's known as constrictive pericarditis, even after treatment, which is why we often give them steroids to prevent complications. So your diagnosis is usually reached by analyzing a pericardial effusion. So it may show lymphocytosis, but the yield is very low. When you do a chest x-ray, the heart shadow may be enlarged. That may suggest an infusion. Infusion, you may have a, an ultrasound that should be done, which would dis demonstrate this effusion. You treat them with your TB treatment just like with pulmonary TB, and you give them steroids, prednisolone 60 milligrams daily for two to six weeks. Minary TB, you can think of this as sort of hematogenous spread to different organs. It can spread to the spleen, it can spread to the liver, it can spread also to the lungs. It can also involve the CNS in 20% of the cases. It's common in children and those that are immunocompromised that will have constitutional symptoms, the fever, the night sweats, anorexia, weakness, weight loss but they may or may not have respiratory symptoms. These patients are actually very sick when you examine them. They'll have hepatomegaly, they may have splenomegaly, they may have lymphadenopathy. And remember, because these features are nonspecific, you need to develop a high index of suspicion to make the diagnosis. So systemic upset is the rule. So respiratory symptoms usually 
is going to be seen in the majority of the cases. Other findings are going to be liver, even splenic microabscesses, deranged liver enzymes, or even cholestasis, and sometimes GI symptoms. On your x-ray, you get these admitted like seed lesions that you see infiltrating the chest bilaterally. I added a picture in the next slide. Your diagnosis is, of course, through blood cultures. Your bronchoviolar lavage, which is usually uh, smear negative, yield is very low, but culture positive. Your lumbar puncture can be performed if there is suspected CNS involvement. Then you can sample any other organ that is affected. So this is what the millet-like seeds actually look like, very, very conspicuous of TB. Even here, you may see them very, very conspicuous of TB. So a differential diagnosis for a miliary picture, it could be miliary TB, it could be histoplasmosis, it could be sarcoidosis, pneumoconiosis, pulmonary siderosis, bronchial viola carcinomas, hematogenous spread of primary thyroid cancers, kidney cancers, trophoblastic cancers, and even some sarcomas in some cases. Could sometimes affect the pleura. So remember, initially your patients will be asymptomatic. They may have a fever. They may have the pleuritic pain, which is often unilateral. They may have dyspnea. When you examine them, because they may have this pleurifusion, so they may have downness or stony downness, decreased breath sounds on the affected site, decrease in tactile fremitus. When you examine the fluid from the pleural space that you get from through your thoracosynthesis, of course, you're going to send this for gen expert. You're going to send it for smear culture. And usually there's a low positivity, less than 5%. For culture, it's less than 15%. And elevated adenosine deaminase is digestive of TB. Your chest x-ray is also quite helpful. It may see, you may see this homogeneous opacity. There may be obliteration of the costophrenic angle with a meniscus sign, suggestive of a pleural fusion. Impayima may sometimes be there. So you see pus on the, on the in the pleural cavity. Remember, impayima cannot be made. You can make a diagnosis of impayima on x-ray. You're just going to be seeing it just like an effusion. How do we treat these patients? You start them on TB treatment. If it's a massive effusion, you may need to drain that effusion, so put an ICD. If it's pus, you call that as empyema. You want to refer them to a higher level facility, if you're at a lower level facility, put them. these patients also on TB treatment. For blood, you suspect malignancy, so refer them to a higher level facility to be investigated further. It may sometimes affect the lymph nodes, we call this as TB lymphadenitis. This is the second most common site of infection, common in HIV patients, but this shouldn't be a surprise. Extra thoracic nodes are commonly affected, and um, they're more commonly affected than the intrathoracic and the mediastinal lymph nodes. But the commonest site are the cervical and the supraclavicular. You may also have the axillary and the inguinal lymph nodes being affected. Remember, this is going to cause painless swelling of the lymph nodes. They'll be non-tender. Initially, they'll be mobile, but later on, they may be matted. They may stick together, and sometimes they may actually form pus that may actually form the sinus tract to the skin. They may sometimes be indurated. And they'll have this characteristic feel like a cold abscess. They won't have these characteristic features of what an abscess should have, the warmth, the pain. So they have this cold abscess that may form. Half of these do not have constitutional symptoms like the fever or the night sweats. We make a diagnosis by needle aspiration if the lymph nodes are fluctuant. We send that for gen expert. We send it for culture. Sometimes it may perform a fine needle aspiration and cytology under radiological guidance if the lymph node is not fluctuant. If the fine needle aspiration and cytology comes out negative, we want to do a lymph node excision biopsy for histopathology. So the mediastinal nodes sampling can be done. Um, you may perform endobronchial ultras ultrasound uh, transbronchial needle aspiration, um, mediastinoscopy or mediastinostomy. Um, your chest x-ray may show nodes in the chest, so you may see some mediastinal enlargement. Your abdominal ultrasound may show intra-abdominal lymph nodes. Your CT scan may show central areas that appear necrotic of the lymph nodes. Sometimes they may even be found along the aorta. You may get this paraiotic lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes typically can be enlarged for several months before you actually make a diagnosis. So you start your patients on TB treatment, and in the absence of the bacteriological diagnosis, and a poor clinical response, investigate them for some other things. It could be that this person is having maybe a lymphoma. Start investigating them for that because they have similar symptoms. So here is a CT scan showing some paraiotic lymph node enlargement. Sometimes it could be affecting the GIT. So remember, it can affect any part of the GIT from the mouth to the anus. 
It commonly affects the terminal ileum, it commonly affects the cecum. Remember, this would be the background of someone swallowing sputum. It can spread to the GIT hematogenously. It can spread via the ingestion of raw, unpasteurized, or unboiled milk. So patients may have abdominal pain in the right iliac fossa, abdominal distension, and abdominal mass, chronic diarrhea, anemia. They may have symptoms of intestinal obstruction, hematochesia, which is frank blood on the stool. One third of these patients will present with intestinal obstruction. You can take them to theater and discover that this is TB. You may have generalized peritonitis. 50% have x-ray evidence of pulmonary TB. They'll have the constitutional symptoms of fever, night sweats, weight loss, anorexia, and they'll have a palpable mass on the abdomen. And if it's involving the peritoneum, it can also involve the liver. It can also involve the spleen. Remember, your major differential diagnosis is your, CA, uh, your CECO carcinoma as well as the Crohn's disease. On your abdominal ultrasounds, you may see your paraiotic nodes, you may see loculated ascites, you may see an abdominal mass. Your CT scans may show mesenteric thickening and lymph node enlargement. You may do an acidic tap for gen expert and culture. It has a low positivity rate. When you do your um, SAG ratio, remember SAG is just simply serum, acidic, um, albumin gradient. So you get the concentration of the albumin in the blood minus the concentration of albumin in the serum. If it is less than 1.1 grams per deciliter, this is suggestive of TB. You get an elevated adenosine deaminase. Endoscopic and even colonoscopic studies can be done. A small bowel follow-through will show this transverse ulceration. You may see diffuse narrow narrowing of the bowel. You may see shortening of the cecal pole. Your histo histology and even culture sometimes is very difficult to actually get. So your specimens could be obtained through colonoscopy, laparoscopy, laparotomy, and you want to start them on TB treatment. You drain the acidic fluid for symptomatic relief in these patients. It could affect the genitourinary system. So remember, it can affect any part of the genitourinary system. So it may range to it being asymptomatic for a long period of time, and they develop dysuria, intermittent hematuria, flank pains. Your males may have swelling and even pain of the testes, some form of epididymitis. The females may present with infertility, usually it's non-specific symptoms of abdominal pains. When you examine them, they'll have this renal angle tenderness, swelling of the scrotum, epididymis in the males. The diagnosis is, of course, you get your urine for gen expert, urine for uh, lipoarabinomanin, so that's a urine lab. Get your urinalysis, which may show the low levels of pH. You may see pyuria, sterile pyuria. So when you culture this, um, when you culture this, you're not going to be seeing any bacteria. So you may get hematuria, they may get pyuria, but the culture is negative. We call that a sterile pyuria. The diagnosis is, of course, culturing the urine repeated, repeatedly for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Your ultrasound of the renal, scrotum, ovary, and even a gynecological ultrasound should be done. It may show fluid collection with loculations, fibrinous strands. Cytos, cystoscopy, rather, can show you retro strictures. You want to also do your needle biopsies. Then it affects more females and it affects more males, and more females are going to present with infertility and pelvic pain. Remember, you want to start your patients on TB treatment. You also want to consult your urologist or your gynecologist as early as In terms of skeletal TB, remember that this one is usually usually due to reactivation of the hematogenous site or extension from a nearby lymph node. So most commonly, it's going to affect the spine, the hips, and the knees. It can also affect the elbow. A spinal TB is what we refer to as POTS disease or tubercular spondylitis. So in adults, it's commonly affecting the lower thoracic and the lower vertebra, lumbar vertebra, and it may present with this swelling, which is known as a gibbous. It may be on the back. They may also have pain on the back. They may or may not have paraparesis. They may, have, may or may not have paraplegia because you're compressing the spinal cord. The x-ray of the spine may show a weight-shaped collapse of the vertebra. Your CT scan and MRI should also be done. Remember, TB in other bones and the joints can present with pain, can present with swelling. If it's joint TB, any joint can be affected, commonly the weight-bearing joints, so the hip and the knee. The patients will have this progressive swelling of the joints, they'll have pain and limitation of movement, and if you don't treat this, the joint can actually be destroyed. This is another form of severe TB, so we treat them for 12 months. So we should consult orthopedic surgeons quite early enough and send the patients for physiotherapy very early enough. So here is uh, imaging of a patient. As you can see, this has collapsed here. And this is um, also having some caseation that's there, some 
sort of necrosis that is there, so TB of the spine. It may sometimes be affecting the joints, we call that as TB arthritis, so this is, occurs as primary disease in children. In adults, it's usually due to hematogenous spread from secondary pulmonary or even renal lesions. It's a very gradual presentation, and this actually is a very big problem because your diagnosis will be delayed. It can actually invade and affect the synovium. It can affect the intervertebral disc, so you get this case eating granulomas and rapid destruction of the cartilage and adjacent bones. You may sometimes get this reactive polyarthritis, which is known as Ponset's disease. The elbows, the hips, and the knees, 30% of the time, are quite commonly affected, but around 50% of the cases are going to be affecting the spine. So your patients will have this chronic monoarthritic limitation of movements, unilateral effusion in the affected joints. Patients may be febrile, they may have night sweats, they may have anorexia, they may have loss of weight. Usually, some risk factors are going to be things like debility, excess alcohol intake, immunosuppression, and even in patients with HIV and AIDS. Investigations you want to do, a culture of the fluid, and even... Uh, a biopsy of the synovium plus a gene expert. These have a low positivity rate. An x-ray of the chest can be performed and even of the joint. So initially, you're going to get this normal joint, but then sometimes the joint space may be reduced. You may get some bone destruction that you see. If it's seen quite rapidly, don't delay treatment. If you delay, then of course you may get bone destruction. The MRI usually shows this abnormality early in the spine and a CT-guided biopsy from the affected disc is often necessary to obtain cultures. Your x-ray of the joint may show destruction of the affected joint. And of course, you treat as for pulmonary TB with treatment being for 12 months because this is a severe form of TB. So the joint should be rested, the spine should be mobilized in the acute phase, refer them to a specialist as early as possible. Could sometimes cause osteomyelitis. So this is really due to hematogenous spread from a reactivated primary focus in the lungs, or it could be from the gastrointestinal tract. Remember that the disease will start off as intra-articular bone uh, disease. Then remember the spine is commonly involved and you may get damage of the two bodies of the neighboring vertebra leading to the collapse and angulation of the spine. It may even result in formation of a gibbous. I already told you about this. So you may sometimes get pus that can track along the tissue planes and may discharge at a point far away from the vertebra. You may get symptoms that may be uh, consisting of local pain. Uh, later, you're going to have the swelling if the pus is collected. You may get uh, systemic symptoms like malaise, fever, and night sweats. Remember that the treatment is as for pulmonary TB, but you may even extend it to nine months together with initial immobilization. Some even extend it to 12 months. This actually should be extended even to further 12 months. Then it could also affect the skin. You may have different types of skin manifestations. So you may have lupus vulgaris, which is usually arising because of this post-primary infection. So you get this apple jelly-like appearance of these lesions. They usually present on the head, they're present on the neck, and they'll have this red-brown nodules. Like I say, they look like apple jelly, especially when you compress a glass slide over it. And they may heal with scarring, they may form new lesions that slowly spread out to form this chronic solitary erythematous plaques. You may sometimes get those chronic lesions that are at high risk of progressing into squamous cell carcinoma. You may have tuberculosis, verrucosa cutis, which will be arising from those that are partially immune to TB, but those that have uh, suffered uh, direct inoculation into the skin usually it presents as this watt-like lesions on a cold erythematous base. You may sometimes see scrofoderma, which is going to be arising from an infected lymph node, which spreads to the skin and causes ulceration. It may cause scarring. It may cause a discharge. Remember that tuberculides are pretty much a group of rashes that are because of the immune reaction to TB rather than the infection. So you may see erythema nodosum, which is the commonest presentation, or erythema induratum, which will produce these similar deep red nodules, but these are usually found on the calves rather than the shins, and they often ulcerate. So in the skin, typical presentation, you get this chronic, painless, non-pathognomic lesions. When you examine them, the, if they have ulcers, they are usually undermined, and they may be erythema, they may sometimes be large tuberculomas. You do a punch biopsy and send the specimen for smear, culture, and pathology, then you start them on TB treatment. If it's affecting the eye, remember it can affect any part of the eye. So you may have pain in the eye, loss of uh, or even reduction in vision. You may have swelling or a mass 
with a foreign body sensation. When you examine these patients, you get this granulomatous uveitis, you may get endophthalmitis, you may get retinal detachment, retrobulbar mass, you may get disc edema. Diagnosis is usually presumptive. You want to refer these as early as possible to the ophthalmologist and you should start them on TB treatment. Now, how do we screen and make a diagnosis of patients with TB? So screening is done in three ways. So through symptoms, through chest x-ray, and through C-reactive protein. Mm -hmm. So in terms of symptoms, these are questions that you always ask on your history. So do they have a cough? Remember in HIV, um, positive adults and adolescents, a cough of any duration, we should suspect TB. For those that are HIV negative, more than two weeks, then we should evaluate them carefully for TB. But now even a cough of any duration, regardless of the status, think of TB at the back of your mind. Is this cough productive? If it's productive, is there any blood? What is the nature of the sputum? Is it whitish in color? Do they have any fever? Do have they lost any weight? Do they have any night sweats? Do they have any chest pain? You may get some additional questions that may target the lifestyle that may predispose this patient to TB. Do they have HIV? Do they smoke? Do they drink alcohol or any other substance abuse? Do they have any diabetes or any underlying undernutrition? Remember, you should take a comprehensive history from the index patient. You should get a, com a comprehensive history from the contact as well, because this is very important that you treat the index patient and the contact. Now, if, if you look at our times nowadays, we have COVID going on a lot. So in the context of COVID screening, you want to risk stratify your patients using your duration of symptoms and your risk factors for TB so that you can identify your presumptive cases. In terms of chest x-ray, remember this has been shown to have a high sensitivity when we combine it with screening for symptoms. And you may get a wide different manifestations that you see on the x-ray. But remember I told you, those that are HIV suppressed and have a very low immune system, you may actually get a normal x-ray. So a normal x-ray in the suspicion of TB in an HIV patient does not rule out TB. So it has a value in actually identifying patients with subclinical TB before the onset of symptoms actually come. So you may get cavitations, consolidations in the upper zones, pleural and pericardial effusions, pleural reactions, pneumothorax, hyalur lymphadenopathy, miliary infiltrates, nodules and even fibrotic changes, lower zone infiltrates in people living with HIV who can have atypical presentations such as infiltrates in the lower lobes. So here are some pictures. Here you have some apical involvement. Okay, you can see here, it looks like a cavity over here. Um, then here you have this one having primary TB, of course affecting the lower zones. Here you have a miliary picture. You may get this consolidation here. And this is a digital chest X-ray PA inverted and enhanced. Then I already showed you these two images of the abdominal CT as well as this MRI. You should also screen them for CRP. Remember, CRP is this acute phase reactant. It's a biomarker of conditions that are going to be associated with inflammation, TB being one of them. It's not very specific for TB, but we can use it as a tool to screen for TB in adults and in adolescents that are living with HIV in combination with symptoms. So if you don't have your x-ray, but you have CRP for some reason, you can use symptoms with CRP. So if either is positive, a person should be considered as a presumptive TB patient. Remember that the turnaround time for CRP is quite quick. The, it can take about three to five minutes, so it can allow for quick evaluation, quick diagnosis for those that are having TB. And if it's negative, you can put those that are at risk on tuberculous preventive treatment. So an additional benefit is that the CRP can actually alert the, the clinician that this patient has some sort of inflammatory process that is going on could be a bacterial pneumonia, it could be a bronchitis, or other infectious, and even sometimes non-infectious things like lymphomas. So here is how you do it. So you're suspecting a patient with um, TB, maybe they're living with HIV. You screen them for symptoms, the cough, the fever in the night sweats, the loss of weight, the chest pain. If they don't have this, it's ne if it's negative, then you want to do a C-reactive protein. If you do a C-reactive protein and your C-reactive protein is normal, then of course it means that this patient is unlikely to have TB. So you, you put them on 
your TB preventive therapy. If you do your symptoms and they're positive, and then you also screen them for C-reactive protein and it's positive, you want to then evaluate this patient for TB. And after you evaluate your patient for TB, you may start them on TB treatment. If they don't have TB, put them on prophylaxis. Remember that CRP above the upper limit has a sensitivity of 98% and specificity of 59% in making a diagnosis of TB. A very low concentration of CRP, less than 1.5 milligrams per liter, generally has a 100% negative predictive value, and concentrations greater than 400 uh, milligrams per liter have a 100% positive predictive value for TB. Remember your investigations that we're going to be doing are largely molecular techniques, blood the tissue samples or biopsies, imaging techniques. So we've already talked about x-ray, you may see infiltrates, consolidation with or without cavities, pleural effusions, thickening or widening of the mediastinum that may be caused by hyla or paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So here is a cavity, there's some consolidation in the upper lobe, there's also a cavity that you can see over there. So the diagnostic tools that are available in Zambia, GenExpert is the most common. This is now regarded as the gold standard. The advantage of GenExpert to test against mycobacterium tuberculosis, it can also give you rifampicin resistance. So it'll check for mycobacterium um, genetic material if it's present. It'll also check if for the presence of rifampicin. It can only check for rifampicin resistance. So it will like sort of like kill two birds with one stone. This is considered as a gold standard. Or you may use Outro, you may use TrueNAT, you may use TB loop mediated isothermal amplification these are all molecular techniques i shall abbreviate it as lamp in the rest of this lecture you may do smear microscopy you may do lateral flow urine lipo arabinomanin i just saw just saw refer to this as lamb you may do your line probe assay this one here is very important because you can use it for drug sensitivity testing it can check for sensitivity and resistance to other drugs of the mycobacterium. You may do solid and liquid culture, you may do whole genome sequencing. These are the different tools that we have in Zambia. Most commonly, some facilities will have GeneXpert, they will most commonly have a urine lamp, they will have the smear microscopy. There are some advanced centers that may have the line probe assay and these other tools. Remember that your molecular techniques are using these to detect the the nucleic acid of mycobacterium. They're going to be recommended in the initial diagnosis of mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and to also detect for primary rifampicin resistance in all patients that are presumed to have TB. So remember the tools that can be used are GenExpert, Ultra, TrueNAT, and even TB Lamp. Remember, GenExpert and Ultra as well as TrueNAT can detect both mycobacterium tuberculosis. It can also detect whether there's rifampicin resistance but the TB lamp can only detect for mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. It can't detect for any resistance. The line probe assay can detect for resistance to other uh, drugs. So for all your patients that are presumed TB cases with signs and symptoms of TB, you perform your gene expert or your true lamp, true nat or your lamp. This can be done on sputum, stool, gastric lavage, nasopharyngeal aspirates. For all your presumptive TB cases with signs and symptoms of extra pulmonary TB, you can do your gene expert on sputum, CSF, lymph node aspirates, lymph node biopsies, pleural fluids, peritoneal fluid, pericardial fluid, synovial fluid, urine, and even pus. Then all HIV positive presumed TB cases with signs and symptoms of disseminated TB, you do your gene expert on the sputum, blood, CSF, lymph node aspirate, lymph node biopsies, pleural fluid, peritoneal fluid, pericardial fluid synovial fluid, urine, and even pus. Now, how do we report the gene expert results? What are you going to get back? So they'll tell you mycobacterium not detected, meaning that it's negative. If they send you back mycobacterium detected, rifampicin resistance not detected, it means this person has TB, but it's rifampicin resistant. So we call this as a bacteriologically confirmed TB. If they send you a result and they say mycobacterium tuberculosis detected, rifampicin resistance detected, it means this person is positive for rifampicin resistant TB. So they have bacteriologically confirmed drug resistant TB. Then if there's mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, detected in rifampicin resistance intermediate, or rather indeterminate rather, so this is, means that there is a positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis 
And so this is a bacteriologically confirmed case of TB, but rifampicin resistance results were inconclusive. So you have to do other tests, other drug sensitivity tests. If it's an inconclusive result, whether it's an error, invalid, or there's no result, it means you have to repeat the, the test. Sometimes I'll tell you um, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis detected trace rifampicin resistance result in determinant. So it means that the patient is positive in this trace amount of the DNA and there's an inconclusive result of the rifampicin resistance. So in patients with no history of TB in the past five years, this result means that the patient has a bacteriologically confirmed TB. So here's a flow chart. So I think it should be the same thing that is in the previous slide. So we do your gene expert, for example. We say that these mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis detected, rifampicin resistant, not detected. You start this patient on treatment. They have drug sensitive, uh, rifampicin sensitive TB. We start them on TB treatment. Those that you detect rifampicin resistance and you also detect mycobacterium, you start them on second line treatment. We send two samples for, of course, your line probe assay and your the drug sensitivity testing. You adjust the treatment according to the results of the drug sensitivity testing. Then those, we'll talk about drug resistant TB in another lecture. So this is just purely just a basic TB. Those that have mycobacterium detected, not trace, but the rifampicin resistance is indeterminate or unknown. So you start them on first line. Repeat the gene expert using a morning sample. You refer one sample for rifampicin resistant testing using gene expert, or you can use TB lamp. Then you refer the second lamp, uh, sample for line probe assay for drug sensitivity testing if the repeat LAM or the repeat TRUNAT is still yielding the same result of indeterminate. If it's trace mycobacterium detected and the rifampicin resistant is intermediate, of course, if the patient has no history of TB or prior TB treatment within the past five years, we start them on treatment. We can also send a sample for culture and drug sensitivity testing. We adjust the treatment based on the results of our drug sensitivity testing. If the patient has a history of TB or prior TB treatment within the past five years, we reevaluate them clinically, we send a sample for culture and drug sensitivity testing, and we use our best clinical judgment whether to start treatment or not. If mycobacterium is not detected and you're still suspecting TB, do an x-ray. So if you're just x-ray suggestive, treat them for TB, send a morning sample for repeat ex gene expert and culture. If your chest x-ray is not suggestive of TB, evaluate them and do other ancillary tests and repeat the gene expert in the morning uh, for a greater high yield. So when TB is ruled out, give them broad spectrum antibiotics. It could be something else. It could be a pneumonia, an atypical pneumonia. If there are no results, so it's an error, it's invalid, the DNA isolation has failed, and then you repeat the molecular testing. If you don't have these molecular tests, what are you going to do? So all your patients that are presumptive TB cases, you collect two samples of sputum, preferably in the morning, do an x-ray if it's available. Send these samples to a lab that can check for TB. Perform your microscopy in both samples on site, then refer one sample to GeneXpert and TrueNet testing. So choose the sample with a better quality and volume. So one or both of the smears being positive, treat them as first line. If the patient is at risk of drug-resistant TB or there's a contact of a drug-resistant TB, start them on second line while you wait for the gene expert and the true NAT results. These are the early patients that should be referred to those advanced treatment centers, UTH being one of them. Then refer or review the treatment regimen based on the results of the gene expert and the true NAT. Those that have gotten both smears being negative, if the chest x-ray is suggestive of TB, treat them with first line. Adjust the treatment based on the gen expert results if there is any rifampicin resistant that is detected. If the chest x-ray is not suggestive or it's not available, you can perform full clinical evaluation, do other tests, rule out TB. If you have ruled out TB, give them broad spectrum antibiotics. We can sometimes do microscopy and culture. So specimens could be sputum, pleural fluid, peritoneal, CSF, blood dis body discharges. We may use a modified Zedin stain. We may use fluorescence microscopy. Remember that your definitive diagnosis will depend on detection of mycobacterium from the culture species. So since the culture is going to take a quite a long time to grow, four to six weeks, the culture is often not available as a guide to start patients on treatment. So you should get your samples as early in the morning and more than two samples to increase the yield. So the if they can't produce sputum, you can induce sputum by nebulizing them with hypertonic saline. Then this will give you a more diagnostic yield than your bronchoscopic samples. You may sometimes push in an NGT, especially in pediatric patients, push in an NGT in the morning, then 
of course withdraw it send that sample we call that as a gastric lavage you can do it on three consecutive days in a week to increase the yield you may do a bronchoviola lavage if the cough is unproductive and induction of sputum is not possible you can aspirate the pleural fluid and do a pleural biopsy you can sometimes do your nasoendoscopic bronchoscopic examination and biopsy of the vocal cords with biopsy for culture uh, and histology in the laryngeal disease. So how do they report these results? So if it's fluorescence microscopy, they are examining it at 400 um, magnification. So if there's no AFB in one length, they, you're going to record it in the lab register as no AFB seen. You're going to report it as no AFB seen. This means that it's negative. Any other result that is apart from this is considered as positive. So if there's one to two AFB in one length, report the actual number then this is a low yield positive. If there's 3 to 24 AFB in one length, this is scanty positive. We report, we're going to get a report as a low yield. This is all positive. 1 to 6 AFB in one field, 1 plus. 7 to 60, 2 plus. More than 60, 3 plus. And all these are considered as positive. In terms of ZN stain, how do we report this? If there's no AFB in 100 fields that you examine, then there's no AFB seen. So this will be reported as no AFB seen. So it's a negative result. Anything else is considered as positive. 1 to 9 AFB in 100 uh, fields, we record the exact number. This is a low positive. 10 to 99, 1 plus in 100 fields. And then 1 to 10 AFB per field, if you check 50, is considered 2 plus. More than 10 AFB uh, per field, we check 20 fields, we consider this as 3 plus. All these are considered as positive results. Now, there are some patients that we can do uh, urine lamb, which is the lipoarabinomannan. So this is like an antigen that is found in the bacteria of the TB. So if it's broken down, it means that this patient has some form of TB in their body. But remember, this is not done for all patients. We only do it for patients that have ad adults, adolescents, and children that are, have HIV or those that are under 5 or those that have CKD irrespective of the HIV status. So we want to assess for signs and symptoms of TB, sepsis, advanced HIV disease, the CD4 count, um, check for the severity of malnutrition if they're under 5, grade the CKD. For those that do not have the, irrespective of the HIV status, if they have signs and symptoms of TB, for example, if they have sepsis, moderate malnutrition or severe malnutrition, then we collect sample for uh, sputum, stool, gastric aspirator, and we perform gen expert testing on these. If they come out positive, we start them on treatment. And for these patients, if they come out negative, we can't do urine lamb together with gen expert. So if you're urine lamb, you, connect your, you collect your urine lamb in the morning and you do your urine lamb and it's positive, we start them on treatment. And you should still collect sputum. You should still collect the uh, gastric aspirate, even gen expert testing. And if the gen expert is negative, then we should do some uh, culture and even drug sensitivity testing and adjust the treatment based on the results of the drug sensitivity testing. Then for those that are living with HIV, if they have positive features of TB, signs and symptoms, if they have sepsis, if they have HIV, advanced HIV, if they're having a CD4 count less than 200, if they're having, um, of course, chronic kidney disease, we collect sputum again for gen expert testing. We should also collect urine lamb if it's positive, start them on treatment. For those that do not have any signs, but they have sepsis, they have advanced HIV, um, they have CD4 count less than 200, they are having chronic kidney disease, we collect the urine uh, sample for lamb. If it's positive, start them on treatment. Also, do not forget gen to collect samples for gene expert as well. If it's negative, we manage the other clinical symptoms and the other clinical conditions, we investigate them further. So it's not all patients that you should be routinely doing urine lamb on. How do you get a report? So it may come out as positive, meaning they've detected mycobacterium from the, spe from the specimen and this patient has bacteriologically confirmed TB. If it's negative, then it's not been detected. If it's invalid or indeterminate, it means that the result is not conclusive, so the test should be repeated. So remember, way back we used to do a purified protein derivative test or a PPD test, also known as a Mantux test or a tuberculin skin test, where they get some purified antigens and inject them underneath your skin, mark the area, and then measure the duration after some time. This is not used to make a diagnosis of acute cases of TB because it will be positive in almost everyone. So the PPD is, rarely, is relatively insensitive and non-specific with acute illness. Now we can also do other tests, adenosine deaminase test. Remember that ADA or ADA is an enzyme that's going to be present in the body. 
whose main function is pretty much purine metabolism, but it also functions in keeping the immune system healthy and even developing of the immune system. It is also has minor functions in gestation. It also helps in release of amino acids. It also helps in neurotransmission and even epithelial cell differentiation. So remember that ADA is usually done to measure the levels of ADA in the pleural fluid to make a diagnosis of TB. So remember in rare cases, it can also be done on CSF. It can also be done on peritoneal fluid. The normal range is less than 40. And if the levels are increased, it may suggest that the mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. But remember that other things like sarcoidosis, pulmonary embolism, cancers, lupus, ADA may be mildly or even moderately elevated. Other tests we want to do in our patients, ASR, which may be raised, a full blood count, which may show anemia or, and leukocytosis, predominantly monocytes, liver function tests, kidney function tests like urea, electrolytes, and creatinine. So when you do all these tests, what do we call a bacteriologically confirmed case? So it means that you have yield positive results using your microscopy culture or your WHO approved rapid diagnostic tests like your GenExpert, your Ultra, your TrueNAT, and your Lyme probe assay, your urine lamp, or even your TB lamp. If they come out positive, it means that you have a bacteriologically confirmed TB case. Clinically diagnosed TB is if it doesn't meet the criteria for bacteriologically confirmed case, but it is high index of suspicion that this patient has TB. So it's either based on chest x-ray abnormalities, suggestive histology, or even extra pulmonary cases without any laboratory confirmation. So remember, clinical diagnosis should always be investigated and you should always get a microbiological diagnosis as you start your patients on treatment already. So what, how do you treat patients? What's our treatment recommendations? So all drug-sensitive TB patients should be treated on first-line TB drugs. So we provide adherence, support, and counseling to all patients that are starting treatment. And of course, as part of treatment response monitoring, all patients must submit sputum at two months. Then for those that have bacteriologically confirmed cases, they must resubmit sputum at five months and at six months. For the previously treated patients, you send a sample for GenExpert if the diagnosis was made using any other test. Send the samples for line probe assay and even culture and drug sensitivity testing. Then start them on first line treatment while you wait for the full drug sensitivity testing results. So for those that are failing first line treatment, what do we mean? So if they send the smear at two months and the smear is still positive, then they are failing the first line treatment. So we should send samples for GenExpert line probe assay and culture and perform a full clinical evaluation of these patients. Usually the, the drugs are going to fail because patients are not compliant to them. So if the patient has not improved clinically or there have been concerns of non-adherence, then you continue with the intensive phase until the results for those tests that you've sent are back. At the same time, consult with the experts to guide on the management of the patient. What are the principles of management of TB patients? So we should use the correct dose of multiple drugs for effective therapy. There is no rule of you adding a single drug to a failing regimen. Monotherapy is a no-no. We don't treat TB with one drug. We should treat it with multiple drugs. Then the drugs are taken daily for a specific period, depending on the severity of the disease and the clinician's clinical expert opinion. Here are some important things to do before treatment. So number one, you should explain everything. The responsibility of the patient and the caregivers in the treatment, the responsibility of the healthcare workers in the treatment. Provide proper adherence counseling, and this should be done at every interaction you have with the patient. Discuss with the family members about TB and even the treatment of TB, including a need for supporting and even uh, providing care for the patient to adhere to the treatment. Provide proper nutrition, so you must be very knowledgeable about TB so that your patients also become knowledgeable about TB. Collect your baselines for a complete blood culture, or rather, a complete blood count, renal function test, liver function test, and this, however, should not delay you starting treatment. The drugs that we use, remember the mnemonic RIPE, R-I-P, so R for rifampicin, I for isoniazide, P for perizinamide, E for ethambutol. Isoniazide is abbreviated as H or sometimes I-N-H. Ethambutol is abbreviated as E. Rifampicin is abbreviated as R or R-I-F. Perizinamide is abbreviated as Z. So the treatment of TB is divided into two phases. There's what is known as the intensive phase where you're giving four drugs, four fixed or four drug a combination, four fixed drug combination. And these are given for two months until the sensitivity testing is known. So rifampicin, isoniazide, perizinamide, and ethambutol. Then the continuation phase, you drop two drugs. You're going to drop ethambutol, you're going to drop 
the pyrazinamide and continue on rifampicin and isoniazide for the remaining months, which could be four to 10 months. Then the, remember that rifampicin and isoniazide are the backbone of these drugs. So the only forms that of TB that must have be treated for longer than six months are those that are severe forms of TB. TB meningitis, 12 months. TB in pregnancy, you can go up to nine months, sometimes 12 months. TB osteomyelitis, 12 months. So those that have HIV, in pulmonary TB, you can treat them for six months. So there's no evidence that if you treat them for nine months or even longer, there's any benefit. Those that are taking isoniazide must be given vitamin B6 to prevent peripheral neuropathy. That could be a side effect of isoniazide treatment. So here is a simplified treatment duration. So all forms of non-severe TB, two months of the rifampicin, isoniazide, prisinamide, and ethambutol, four months of rifampicin and isoniazide. Miliary TB, same thing. Two months of rifampicin, isoniazide, prisinamide, and ethambutol, four months of rifampicin and isoniazide. If the managers are involved, you extend this for 12 months. TB meningitis, tuberculomas, osteoarticular TB, ocular TB, spinal TB, treat for one year. So two months intensive phase, 10 months continuation phase. So what are the weight bands and dosing for the TB treatment? If they're 25 to 37, two tablets. If they are 38 to 54, three tablets. If they're 55 to 70, four tablets. If they're 71 and above, five tablets. So remember that the combination 150 milligrams of rifampicin, 75 milligrams of isoniazide, 400 milligrams of perizinamide, uh, 275 of uh, the ethambutol. These are the four drugs which are put in one pill. Then continuation phases are simply 150 milligrams of rifampicin, 75 milligrams of isoniazide. So is there any role for a four-month regimen? Because newer evidence has actually suggested that we could actually treat some patients for four months. So those patients that are aged 12 or older, we can treat them. And if they have drug-sensitive TB, we can treat them with four-month regimen consisting of isoniazide, rifapentin, moxifloxacin, and even pyrazinamide. But there are some other additional conditions and considerations that have to be made. Though... Some of these drugs, uh, we may not have them readily available in our setup. If you want to read much more on this, just head over to the WHO uh, page. They have this on the four-month regimen that is being advocated on. Because remember that the six-month regimen that we had is as far back as the 1980s. That's where the evidence was from that we treat TB for six months. So what are some of the indications for steroid use in TB treatment? Common indications include TB meningitis, TB pericarditis, TB iris, Massive pleural effusions, massive lymphadenopathy with pressure effects, hypersensitivity reactions that are severe to anti-TB treatment. Less common things are hypoadrenalism, renal tract TB to prevent ureteric scarring, TB laryngitis with life-threatening airway obstruction, and remember that the steroids must not be stopped abruptly. They must be tapered off. If it's TB meningitis, 1 to 2 milligrams per kg, maximum dose of 60 milligrams, for two weeks and you taper it off over six weeks. TP pericarditis, well, one to two milligrams per kg. This is milligrams per kg, maximum of 60 for four weeks, then half for four weeks, maximum of 30 milligrams per day, then you taper it off for several weeks. TB pleural effusion or other forms of severe TB, 0 0.5 to one milligram per kg, maximum is 30 milligrams. Then for one to two weeks and you taper it off over several weeks. Remember that the steroids are immunosuppressant and why are we giving them if there's an infection? It's because the benefits are going to greatly outweigh the risks. There is a risk of them developing opportunistic infections, yes, especially those that have TB and HIV, but the benefits of you giving a steroid will greatly outweigh the risk. And with those that have adrenal TB, we want to cover them on hydrocortisone because it will have this mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid property. So what are the treatment outcomes? So it, the patient could be cured, meaning that they have PTB that was bacteriologically confirmed. Then they completed the treatment without any evidence of the failure, meaning after two months, the smear was negative. After five to six months, the smear was negative. And they, they have a bacteriological response. Treatment being completed is a patient who has completed the treatment as recommended by the national policy, but whose outcome does not meet the definition for cured or treatment failure. Then those that have treatment failure is those that are still have a, those with whose smear um, negative um, culture is positive, or rather sputum smear is positive during the last month of treatment, or 
a treatment regimen needed to be terminated or permanently changed to a new regimen, we say that they have treatment failure. Those that have died, of course, is those that have died before starting treatment or during treatment. Those that are lost to follow up on the six month regimen is a patient that has been diagnosed with TB who did not start treatment or whose treatment was interrupted for two consecutive months or more. Those with four months regimen, it's a patient that is diagnosed with TB who did not start treatment or whose treatment was interrupted for more than a week. And any patients uh, whose uh, interrupted treatment should complete a six months treatment regimen. Then those that are not evaluated is those who have not been assigned, assigned an outcome. Then treatment success, of course, the sum of the cured and even the treatment completed. Then remember that um, these things are very important to remember when you're treating these patients with TB. What about TB and pregnancy? Remember all the first-line TB drugs are safe in pregnancy and pregnant women that are Bound with TB should be started on TB treatment immediately. Those that become pregnant while they are on TB treatment for some reason, continue them on the TB treatment. All women that have TB and intend to become pregnant should be encouraged to first consult their physician before they get pregnant. If they're taking oral contraceptives, remember rifampicin can alter the concentrations of the hormonal-based contraceptive. So you want them to use an alternative source or an alternative non-hormonal contraceptive like a condom. In terms of breastfeeding, they should still continue while they're breastfeeding. If they're smear positive, encourage them to spend less time with their child. If they're spending time with their child, they should be in a well-ventilated area. They should wear a face mask as much as possible. Avoid coughing on the child, obviously. So the children that are born to mothers with TB should be vaccinated with PCG at birth, be given TB preventive treatment. And um, as soon as the child is well and has no signs or symptoms of, uh, that is suggestive of congenital TB, after they complete the TB preventive treatment, if the child, uh, the child should be revaccinated if the child doesn't have a PCG scar. So if the mother develops TB during breastfeeding, you should give the child TB prophylactic or preventive treatment if they are screened negative for TB and revaccinate them if they have no scar. If they are HIV positive with HIV exposed infant, they should be given BCG at birth. And when active TB has been excluded, they should be initiated on the TB prophylactic or preventive treatment. And at the end of this course, they should receive vaccination if they don't have a BCG scar. In terms of TB and renal disease, remember isoniazid and rifampicin are eliminated by the biliary tract. So there is no dosing that is needed to be adjusted. For those that are hepatotoxic is where you have to make some adjustments. Remember of the three drugs, the one that is um, going to be significantly excreted from the kidneys is going to be ethambutol and its metabolite and metabolites of pyrazinamide. So the dose should be adjusted. So ethambutol is going to be given at half the daily dose. The pyrazinamide Dosage should be adjusted as per creatinine clearance, and then the dosage of pyrazinamide is 25 mg per kg, and ethambutol at 15 mg per kg is recommended if your creatinine clearance is less than 30 mL per minute. While receiving isoniazide, your patients with severe renal insufficiency or failure should be given pyridoxine to prevent peripheral neuropathy. In terms of liver disease, remember the most hepatotoxic is pyrazinamide. So this here is the most hepatotoxic, so it can cause liver injury. So remember rifampicin and isoniazide plus one or two non-hepatotoxic drugs such as streptomycin or ethambutol can be used for a total duration of six or 12 months depending on the regimen that is used. If the patient has severe liver damage, uh, which is characterized by two times increase of the upper limit of normal if they are symptomatic in terms of ALT or three times increase of the upper limit of normal if they're asymptomatic of ALT. An alternative regimen should be used, streptomycin plus isoniazide, rifampicin and ethambutol in the initial phase and then followed by either rifampicin and isoniazide for four months or isoniazide and ethambutol in the continuation phase for 12 months. So streptomycin, isoniazide, and ethambutol in the intensive phase, isoniazide, and ethambutol in the continuation phase. Pyrazinamide should be avoided in patients with liver disease. In terms of nutrition, remember that there are some patients that are undernourished. They may benefit from micronutrient supplementation like vitamin D, zinc, thiamine, B12, or rather B complex, and multivit, depending on the clinical scenario that is there, and if they have evidence of alcoholism. Encourage them to consume indigenous fruits and foods and encourage them to eat quite healthy. They should eat with their TB drugs. So all patients should have a nutritional assessment, a body mass index at the minimal least, before we start treatment and even at the start of treatment.
emphasize on the need for a balanced diet. In terms of side effects, they can be divided as minor, major, and life-threatening. So remember, patients with minor side effects, they continue the TB treatment, just give symptomatic treatment for the side effects. If they develop major side effects, then the TB, should be, TB treatment should be withdrawn and the patient should be referred to at a higher level facility. Risk of them developing side effects if they're taking a herbal medications which are hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic, if they have regular alcohol abuse, if they have uh, taking other hepatotoxic medication or drugs like fluconazole, nevirapine, protease inhibitors, if they have a concomitant um, liver disease like viral hepatitis, chronic liver disease, if there's a history of peripheral neuropathy, diabetes, pregnancy, and immediately after the postpartum period, um, or rather in the immediate postpartum period, malnutrition with a low albumin and a low body mass index, all these are at risk of developing side effects. Remember, all TB drugs are um, hepatotoxic to some extent, especially the three, rifampicin, isoniazide, prisinamide. Uh, Prisinamide is the most hepatotoxic. Streptomycin and nithambute, and nithambute are not really hepatotoxic. So isoniazide also causes peripheral neuropathy because of the pyridoxin deficiency. Rifampicin causes these changes in the body fluids. It will cause them to become orange or red. Nithambute causes optic neuritis. Prisinamide causes benign hyperuricemia, which we usually don't treat unless if they develop gout. So here's a table with the major side effects, the drugs which are implicated, and what to do. I won't go through this table because it's self-explanatory. You may pause the video, take a screenshot of this, and of course read through. It should make sense. Same thing with this table, the different types of drugs. I also won't go through this. Just take a screenshot of this and make sure that you know the major and the minor side effects of each and what to do. How do we follow up patients? So all patients must be screened once for clinical review, assessment of side effects, dose adjustment according to the weight, and even assessment of adherence and continued counseling. They must see your patients once a month. So patients that are very sick, you can review them much more frequently. Then of course the frequency of the clinical review can be adjusted based on the clinical outbreaks to protect the patient and also protect you as the healthcare workers. So all patients should have a sputum done in the morning and should take in for AFB smear at month two, regardless of the type of TB and the treatment regimen. Then also follow-up sputum should be done at five months and six months for those that are doing a six-month regimen. And you should evaluate them. If they get a sputum that is positive at two months, at two months, reevaluate them. So if the patient has improved clinically and has been adherent, then proceed to the continuation phase. So you should send samples for gene experts, line probe assay and drug sensitivity testing. Review the results that should be available, usually 48 hours for the gene expert. If the patient has not clinically improved or there has been concerns for non-adherence, we extend the continuation phase by one month. We evaluate for drug resistant TB, we send sputum for urgent gene expert, line probe assay, a culture, drug sensitivity testing, and also review the treatment of the drug sensitivity testing when it's available. Remember adherence, is in two types. You have adherence to treatment, meaning that they're taking the correct dose at the correct time, at the correct way, for as long as it has been prescribed. This is a key factor to treatment of TB success. The adherence to the care, it means that they're coming to the clinic appointments and they're following other instructions that are given by the health mm -hmm. facility staff. So OTB patients should receive adherence counseling at every session at the beginning of treatment and throughout the course of treatment. And the treatment supporter, which are the relative, even the community, should also receive similar information. Research has shown that those relatives that take an active role in the treatment of their patients, their patients tend to actually fare much, much better. So some TB patients should receive intensive adherence counseling and depending on their psycho social needs. Benefits of adherence, of course, is reduced treatment failure. It prevents development of drug resistance. It decreases morbidity and mortality. It prevents further transmission of TB. It improves the quality of life. Some recommendations for patients that have a positive test for sputum at the second month, we reassess the current um, DOTS plan, direct observational um, therapy. So as remember that you want to observe the patients following the drugs each and every day, and they should take on their card. So we discuss alternative for daily dots as convenient for the patient until the smear negative or drug sensitivity results are available. We provide ad adherence counseling 
and support once a week until the patient becomes smear negative and intensive adherence support and enhanced adherence counseling should be provided for these patients either through the healthcare or the community health workers. The first visit must be in person to build a rapport and to be able to understand the barriers that are there to adherence of this person. But the subsequent visits could be held virtually and when an in-person adherence counseling session is done, you should make sure you document it on the patient's files. Wherever possible, uh, the guided patient support groups should be started and this helps reduce stigma and also provides social, psychosocial support. Completion certificates and home visits can also be done. So remember there is DOTS, which is direct observed therapy and surveillance, where the nursing staff can observe this patient taking the drugs. It's usually being given three times a week. So the DOTS is required especially for patients that are thought are not going to be likely to comply, those with history of serious mental illness, those that have a history of non-adherence to TB treatment in the past or even the current treatment course those that are living in the streets, those that are, have multi-drug resistant TB. So sometimes we give them this um, one week multi-blister combo pack that they are supposed to bring back when they have, they bring back empty when they have of course swallowed the tablets. But of course someone could empty these things in the toilet and just come back with a packet. So there are three options, these DOTS plan C, which is the clinic, DOTS plan C, which is V, which is done by volunteers and R, which is done by relatives. So during outbreaks, C and V become not so feasible. So R is usually recommended. And evidence, like I have told you, has shown that mortality is less if the family members take an active role. And it's even better if you allow the patient to choose which family member should be responsible for this. So how do we conduct this? So the drug should be administered under supervision of a designated trained observer or a healthcare worker or a relative that has been counseled. So the drug intake should be monitored every time the patient swallows the TB drug and should be recorded on their patient card. So there's a card that we give them that they take at the back. So if TB treatment is supervised by someone other than the healthcare worker, the patient must be involved in selecting this patient who will supervise them, like I told you. So the patient and his relative should be made aware of the importance of taking the drugs and the sake of adherence in order to reduce transmission to other individuals. We should perform some contact tracing. Remember that the TB contact investigation is very critical in finding other cases of TB that this patient may have exposed other people to. So TB contact investigation saves as the entry point for TB preventive therapy for the close contact. So contact investigations could be screening them for symptoms, physical examination, radiography, microbiological examinations for, sp for specimens, and this reduces morbidity and mortality. Adverse drug reactions to TB medications are more common in HIV-infected patients. And remember that the TB increases HIV viral replication, immune activation, and risk of progression. So remember, we're going to be screening our contacts and people that have been recently infected with TB are in at increased risk of developing active TB within one or two years of acquisition. So it means your contacts that you are screening are the ones that have been there for the past two years, but sometimes even go as, as far back as five years. Two years is quite significant. Then for the children, the period is actually even much shorter. So it's assumed that a person is exposed to, um, it's assumed that the people exposed to a person with infectious TB might have gotten the infection and at risk of developing TB. So screen them. So review any existing information about the patient perform your contact elimination, develop a plan for investigation, prioritize the contact, of course, conduct assessments. You can pause the video, get a screenshot of this. I think it's very self-explanatory. So how do we screen them? So does the contact have any symptoms or risk factors of rap or rapid progression of TB? If it's yes, we evaluate them for TB. Does the contact have a TB disease? If it's no, we start them on TB preventive therapy. If it's yes, we start them on TB treatment. If the contact is younger than five years or HIV, if they are, we start them on preventive therapy. If they are not, we give them education on TB and we screen them for TB. So remember for children that are high risk contacts of multi-drug resistant TB, we offer them levofloxacin, then isoniazide um, prophylaxis, sometimes combined with rufampicin can be given. Then in terms of drug resistance, remember this accounts for only 2% of the million cases of TB. It arises due to incomplete or incorrect drug treatment and can spread from one person to another. It's a very big, big problem. Factors that are associated with this, of course, issue of prior drug treatment of TB, co-infection with HIV and TB, infection acquired in regions which have high rates of drug resistance, contact with a known case of resistant TB, failure to respond to empiric TB despite documentation of adherence, 
exposure to multiple causes of fluoroquinolone antibiotics for presumed community-acquired pneumonias, healthcare workers exposed to cases of resistant TB. Resistance could either be primary resistance where someone gets TB that was already resistant or secondary resistance where the drug resistance develops during TB treatment. You could have monoresistance where there's resistance to one of the first line anti-TB drug which could either be rifampicin resistant or isoniazid resistant. Polydrug resistance is resistance to more than one of the first line anti-TB drugs other than both rifampicin and isoniazide. Multidrug resistant TB is if they're resistant to both rifampicin and isoniazide in combination with other drugs or not. Pre-extensively drug resistant TB is if they have TB and they have a strain that fulfills the definition of multidrug resistant TB and rifampicin resistant TB and they're resistant to any fluoroquinolone. Extensive drug resistance is if they have this the multidrug resistant TB plus resistance to the any fluoroquinolone and at least one of the three injectables of the second line, amikacin, canamycin, capriomycin. So this would be the background of a patient that fulfills the definition of the multidrug resistant TB with rifampicin resistance plus resistant to any fluoroquinolone and at least one of the additional group A drugs. Remember the group A drugs are the most potent drugs in ranking of the second line medicines for the treatment of drug resistant form of TB. But we will look at this a lot in detail in another particular lecture. Some important terms to remember. Remember a TB defaulter is someone whose treatment has been interrupted for two consecutive months. Treatment failure is a presence of continued or recurrent positive cultures during the course of TB treatment. After three months of multidrug resistant PTB caused by the drug susceptible organism, 92 to 95 percent will have a smear negative culture and show clinical improvement. All patients with positive cultures after three months of appropriate treatment must be re-evaluated. So patients whose smear culture remains positive after four months of treatment, we classify them as treatment failure. So it could be because they are non-adherent, there's drug resistant, there's malabsorption of the drug, there are laboratory errors. TB relapse is a patient who had who has become and remained culture negative while receiving the therapy, but then after they complete the therapy, they become culture positive or they have clinical radiological deterioration that is consistent to active TB. In terms of TB prophylaxis, we give chemo prophylaxis to reduce the risk of active infection, especially at those that are at risk. So we give them isoniazide prophylaxis 300 milligrams daily for six months or 300 milligrams daily for three months together with rifampicin. Remember, we should give a BCG vaccine and usually as part of our extended program for immunization, it's a live attenuated vaccine given at birth. It has variable efficacy, but it's still recommended, especially in developing countries. And it shows to have reduced the risk of severe forms of TB like disseminated CNS TB in babies and children. So therefore, it's actually standardized and given worldwide. There are some safety concerns in babies with HIV, but its efficacy in adults is very variable. Last but not least, the complications of TB. Pulmonary complications include pleurisy, pleuroeffusions, empyema, pneumothorax, aspergillosis, endobronchitis, bronchiectasis, CA bronchus, and extrapulmonary complications like laryngitis, copulmonale, and even multisystemic organ failure. I really hope you enjoyed this video on TB. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Sorry for the long, long video. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.